Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to the last keynote of the first annual Fork Conference. My name is Michael Kearns, um, and it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce one of my all-time favorite researchers, uh, John Kleinberg of Cornell University. Um, as usual, I won't bother listing John's awards and honors, not only because they would take too much time, but even then they would underestimate his contributions. I would say the hallmarks of John's research are that he takes the perspective and tools of theoretical computer science, but rather than choosing to apply them to insular inward looking problems, um, instead applies them to problems of broad societal interests. Um, and more often than not, the result is a technical finding that fundamentally clarifies something that was murky um, or confusing before. I think the greatest personal compliment I can pay to a researcher is when they do a piece of work that fundamentally changes forever the way I think about a topic or an area. And if you do that for me even once, I remember you forever. And I think John Kleinberg is one of the few, if only people I can say, who has done that for me multiple times in his career. Um, so it's an honor to introduce him. Let's welcome John. Take it away. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. And. Uh... And just checking people can hear this is this is working okay um well thanks 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 very much michael for for that uh, kind kind introduction and um i it's certainly an honor to be here as part of this uh inaugural running of this conference and also as part of this community which i think really um has been showing you know just a lot of energy and a lot of um creativity in, in 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 how it's approached an important set of problems i'd also like to thank cynthia omer and all the people who contributed to the conference. A big thanks to Aaron for his leadership as program chair. And I and I, I feel like I should obviously acknowledge that we're coming together for this conference at a time that contains a, a lot of pain for many people, only amplified by the fact that this pain is being experienced and born extremely un, unequally. Um, I certainly perceive that very strongly. And I think, you know, I like all of you, you know, have been thinking about, you know, how we can help uh, in these in these situations both in our own everyday lives and also in our professional lives by thinking about skills and perspectives that we have that we might be able to bring to bear on, on the problems that we see. Um, this, this conference, I think, taps into all those impulses and particularly perhaps into, in, into this impulse to try using our um, own pro pro professional backgrounds uh, in addressing problems, to think about how we can demonstrate responsibility in the use of computing and the use of algorithms and the use of AI and the design of computing systems, what it means to demonstrate responsibility against the backdrop of how these systems get built and how they could be built. Um, this is certainly a topic I've uh, thought about a fair amount over the past few, few years about what these questions might mean. And so in this talk, I wanted to share some of that thinking. Um, it applied to a, a particular domain of algorithmic and human decision making. Um, in this, I, I've been joined by um, a number of uh, great collaborators, uh, some of whom are, are here at the conference. And in this particular work, I'll, I'll be talking about things that involve joint work with my PhD student, Manish Raghavan, um, and with three co-authors, a group of co-authors who span uh, three disciplines very different from, from my own, Jens Ludwig in public policy, Sentil Mullenoffen in behavioral economics, uh, and Cass Sunstein in law. Um, before I get to that, and to sort of situate how, I, how I'd like to think about this, and to situate maybe a little bit about how I think about this word responsibility in computing, I'd like to start in the mid-1990s, an exciting time for computing, when um, a theme that was central to fields like human-computer interaction and computer-supported cooperative work suddenly became widespread, thanks to the growth of the web, across all of computing. And that was the idea that we shouldn't think about or organize computing along a single dimensional axis of technical considerations, but to really appreciate that there's this rich second axis, a social axis, along which we have to understand our computing systems, um, how they affect human individuals and human societies. And with the gro growth of the web over that long arc of, of the 1990s, we embraced that idea, right? We built what you know people had for several decades by then called socio-technical systems, and we built them at extremely large scales. And we came to appreciate that you know, although maybe we hadn't been able to perceive this social axis in our thinking about things, it had always been there. And we were making choices about it, whether we knew it or not, right? We were building social and economic decisions into the systems we were, we were building. And that was gonna happen 
inevitably, the only question was whether we were going to be attentive to that or not. And as a result, computing began to engage and parts of computing began to engage quite deeply and quite actively with fields in the social sciences, like sociology, like, I, like I, economics. You know, and I'll, I'll confess that during that era, I developed a sense of optimism uh, that by understanding the human dimensions of the systems we were building, you know, by moving around in this big world with these two axes, we could create better outcomes for society. Now, I should say I'm still optimistic, I think because I'm optimistic by nature. And I think, you know, in the end, our, our goal, goal here is to be producing good. And I think that, you know, one thing we've learned is that it's much more complex, as, as always, these problems are much more complex than you imagine that, them to be. In, in particular, as we moved around in this two-dimensional world, we began encountering bad outcomes, polarization and conflict, bad decisions leveled at individuals and groups, harms from misuse of information. It was somehow as though moving around in this flat two-dimensional world, we were failing to perceive that there was some hidden third dimension that was impacting the systems that, that, we, that we built and leading to these outcomes that we somehow couldn't understand or control. And there was, there really was this third normative dimension to the problem, um, a dimension which we have to think not just about the technical considerations and also not just about the cognitive, economic and social constraints, but the normative ones. What is the right thing to do? What produces a, 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 a good outcome for society and for our, our communities? And this was somehow the key to this third dimension that the simple fact that an actor deeply understands the social dynamics at play in the technical system doesn't mean they'll necessarily use them for good. That's a separate question. And so we find ourselves in this richer three-dimensional space that I would argue is the subject of the conference that we're, that, that we're part of now. And many of the things we learned in our two-dimensional space apply in the three-dimensional space as well. In particular, whether or not you can perceive that dimension, you're making choices in it all the, all the time. The, the systems you build, take into account the technical and the social dimensions, have embedded in them normative decisions, whether you've made them consciously or not. And secondly, in order to actually move in a reasonable way in this three-dimensional space, we're going to have to engage deeply uh, with a, a new set of areas, areas that think about these considerations, areas like law, like science and te 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 technology studies, like critical analysis of information systems, um, and, and many others. Uh, and so I think that's sort of the context in which um, I approach a conference like this and I approach a, a, a talk to all of you. One way to sort of think about, I'll of course be talking about a, a particular slice of some of these normative considerations. And, and of course, it's in the nature of moving around in a three-dimensional space that all, all three dimensions matter. And so as we think about those, we'll still be thinking about the technical and the social issues and how they all operate sim simultaneously. And some of the collaborations I'll be talking about indeed have tried to bring together people with, 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 with all these perspectives. Um, so I'll be thinking about this in particular in the context of algorithmic and human decision-making and the ways in which we see bias uh, uh, appear in them. And, and, and to think about how we, how we arrived at that space, you know, we, we can think about uh, data-driven decision-making <clears throat> and how far we've traveled from some of the things that we're very good at doing, such as building recommendation systems, where we take a person's past history of engagement with a site like Netflix, we reduce that person's taste to a feature vector, uh, and in some high dimensional space, we try to align it with other people with similar feature vectors. And we make predictions about whether, for example, they will like this movie or to estimate the probability they'll like this movie. And people began asking if we're good at this kind of data-driven prediction about individuals, should we be using it perhaps for other areas where in the offline world, people make what are arguably data-driven predictions about individuals. In hiring, for example, you could say that someone submits a resume to a hiring committee and that resume is some kind of a tabular feature-based description to a human committee that looks at it and tries to estimate the probability of, and here we sort of have to stop. What is it they're really trying to estimate when they, they, they look at a resume? What is the objective function that, that they use when they're, when they're trying to hire? These are hard questions for humans. I'll come back to that in a second. Similar thing happens with college applications. I take your K through 12 experience, I reduce it to some tabular set of features that then a collection of humans looks at. And so it goes with many screening decisions in employment and education in the assignment of credits in criminal justice where we might be trying to predict future reoffense. In all of these, there's a pipeline. An individual mapped to features passed through a, de a decision maker who's then making some prediction. Um, and, and we think of these domains that happen in the offline world, um, and, and this is often a, a constellation of things that, uh, 
you, you see invoked when, when you see work in this area as so-called high stakes decision making because each individual decision matters an enormous amount for some person. It has an enormous impact on some person's life. You could go back to the Netflix example and say it wasn't really important if Netflix was correct about whether I, I would like this movie. But it's enormously important whether this person receives a job, is admitted to college, uh, waits for trial in the community or in jail. Now, that's not to say that the serving of online content, such as by recommendation or ranking or personalized news feeds, is overall low stakes. I think we've seen from things like the formation of public opinion and the outcome of elections that you can take 100 billion low stakes decisions, add them all up, and you have something very high stakes. You have the outcome of a political process, for example. I'm simply saying here that each individual decision is, is quite low stakes. Whereas in, in, in these cases, each decision that we make um, is consequential. Each error that we make is enormously high. And so in these areas, we think about the risk of bias and how it comes into just decision making. And a long line of work, including by some of the founders of this conference, created some of the basis for, for how we think about, about these questions. So if we're gonna think about how bias creeps into al algorithmic decisions, and if algorithms are trained on human data, we should start by thinking about bias in human decisions. Now, there's a long history of work in the social and behavioral sciences on the role of bias and how both explicit but also implicit bias can creep into evaluations of people. And just to kind of give some basic examples so we're all kind of, we're all oriented here. Um, let me talk about one of the classics from this domain, this paper from the mid 1990s that was published in Nature by uh, two, soci two sociologists, uh, Christine Venevas and Agnes Vold. And what they did was they went into, um, they essentially at requested the reviews from European Research Commission grant proposals. And as part of those grant proposals, the reviewers evaluated not just the text of the work, but also the uh, PI themselves. And they were supposed to assign them a subjective competence score. Now, what Ben Ross and Vol did was they went through all the ways they could think of, and they went through an, an, an enormous space of possible measures of external impact that these PIs had, right? Number of papers in top venues, citations of those papers, papers in the last some number of years, total volume of output, et cetera. And they put those measures of impact in different ways on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, they put the competence score. And what they found was this troubling figure on the right, that uh, to achieve a given competence score, women as PIs had to have score enormously higher on these measures of impact uh, than men. Or looking up from the x-axis, for a given measure of impact, the, the women were scoring much lower. These studies then got refined over several, several iterations. Confounds were eliminated. There was always this question of, were these two researchers being treated differently, in fact, similar at some un underlying basis? Um, and in some sense, one of the sort of most definitive words on this was uh, a study that my uh, co-author, Sendhil Mulanathan, did early in his career, shortly uh, after he finished his PhD with Marion Bertrand, where they attempted to take all of these questions about similarity out of the picture. They went back to resumes, like the resume I showed you on, on slide two. Um, they sent them out and then waited for callbacks. Uh, so these were fictitious resumes they sent to employers and they waited for the employers to call back and request an interview. And what they did was they sent out two sets of fictitious resumes. The body was the same, but at the top, they put names that either, according to statistics from the US Census, were typically associated with people who were white or with people who were African-American. And they found that in the second case for African-American applicants uh, or people whose names were statistically associated with that community, the callback rates were roughly two thirds what they were for the white applicants, right? Exactly the same resume. They've controlled for everything they could possibly control for, simply the name is different. And many of you, of course, are familiar with the study. It's one of the most replicated studies of the past uh, 20 years in the empirical social sciences. And it, it really says something profound and troubling about, about the way in which, in, in which decisions are being made. Note, of course, that this issue of establishing similarity, these people who are being treated differently, are they at some level the same for purposes of the, the decision is in fact one of the pillars of this area of fairness and algorithms and machine learning as, as established in the seminal fairness through awareness paper of Dork et al. And that's definitely a, a connection point between these, these literatures. So, this is some things we can say about 
human bias. And it's, it's robust when these studies get done now. Uh, you know, it, it would be nice to say that they somehow don't replicate as well, but we still see a, a robustness in those patterns of bias. So let's move to algorithms. Algorithms, in contrast, of course, have no direct incentive to exhibit bias. You just wrote the algorithm. It knows nothing about the world other than what you feed into it. This is a story that we've all recounted, you know, those of us who've worked in fairness many times, that despite this, there are many sources of potential bias in algorithms. We're familiar with this in the choice of label, in the choice of objective function, in the choice of features, right? <clears throat> if, for example, I'm feeding into the algorithm competence scores from a previous panel of European Research Commission proposals, and it had the dynamics I showed you in the plot on the previous slide, then those will be contain the bias of the human reviewers. If I'm trying to predict a competence score using as training data those competence scores based on inputs, it will somehow contain that bias. So these are things we have to wrestle with. What I want to talk about here uh, in this joint work with uh, Jens, Sentel, and Cass is the way in which the interpretability of the algorithms that we build interacts with uh, bias in these algorithms, both the way we can detect bias in the algorithms and actually the way bias may actually manifest itself in the algorithm, both of those at the level of detection and at the level of construction. So let me first start with this question of detection. Um, so my co-author, Cass Sunstein, argues that, in fact, if we think about discrimination law and the two categories of discrimination, one is disparate treatment, in which we deliberately favor, uh, say, applicants to a job, I'll use jobs as my running example, on the basis of protected attributes like race, gender, national origin, religion, or age, and disparate impact, which says regardless of the decision maker's intent, we ask whether a screening decision has a disproportionate ad adverse effect on a protected group, and if so, then, we, then the burden shifts to the decision maker to establish the business necessity of their uh, criterion. If, for example, I, I have a job that absolutely requires people to be very tall, for some reasons idiosyncratic to that job, then having a height restriction um, might in fact uh, be defensible, uh, even if it has an adverse effect, say, on women. Um, on the other hand, if I had a height requirement for a software engineering position, it would be very difficult to establish business necessity. So we take these two, disparate treatment and disparate impact. And what Cass has argued in his past work is that these actually, in their formulation, reflect something about the psychological grounding of human decision making. And they're intimately wrapped up with the difficulty in actually telling why a human decision maker has made the decision that, that they made, and therefore whether they've engaged in these activities. And this is not simply because people, when faced with hard questions about this, might lie, though that certainly, certainly could happen. It may also be, in a more subtle way, that they might genuinely not know their rationale. They might be motivated to help you. They might be motivated to try to explain to you why they made these decisions. And they might not actually be able to do a very good job at that. This is something which has a long history in the behavioral sciences. And in this, I, I want to point to um, some now classic work by Nisbet and Wilson in the 1970s and a long line of work that, that came out of that, where the investigators would bring people into a lab setting and they would ask them to explain their choices with let's call it a known but hidden confounder, okay? And what they would find is that they would change the confounder, people's decisions would change, but their explanations wouldn't reflect that change. So here's, here's an example, we, and it, it, it's sort of a extremely small task you give people. You bring people into, um, into the lab and you ask them to do a word memorization task. You ask them to memorize a whole bunch of words. And then you ask them for, uh, to name a brand of laundry detergent. Um, then you take a second group, group B, and you also ask them to memorize a set of words, but you ask them to memorize words like beach, ocean, moon, waves. And then you ask them to name a brand of laundry detergent. And many, many more of them say tide. Now that's something that we understand it's priming. Uh, that, that doesn't at this point need much explanation. But Nisbet and Wilson did something extra, something interesting. They then asked people, why did you pick the, the brand of detergent that you did? And people gave many reasons. They said, it's because it's the brand we use at home. It's the brand that we use growing up. I remember the logo. It's prominent at the store where I shop. No one said, because you primed me with this set of words. Yet we know that in aggregate, um, many of those people were primed because when I changed the conditions, many more people said that. Right? It's the same way that I can't tell why any one person, many of those people may have genuinely said it because it was what they used when they were growing up. Um, but all we can say is that in aggregate, some of them were primed. In the same way that if we go back to Sandel's resume study early in his career, 
that resume study was not sufficient to say that any one person was discriminating on the basis of race. But unfortunately, it was certainly amply sufficient to say that a large number of people were discriminating on the basis of race. So this is the point. We Often when we talk about interpretability, we think of it as an, uh, a concept reserved for algorithms, that algorithms are opaque, that they're black boxes, that they're very hard to interpret. But we should remember that humans are also uninterpretable. Right? Humans are happy to give you the illusion of an explanation for their actions. The hard part is not, not getting that out of them. The hard part is to decide if that's the actual reason, even if they're well-intentioned, for their actions. So this is the interesting challenge that interpretability poses for auditing bias. And it's, it's quite robust. There are many, many experiments in the Nisbet Wilson uh, uh, pantheon. In another one, people were asked to choose their favorite article of clothing from a rack of clothes, and the rack was oriented to sort of force the rightmost choice on them. Uh, many people chose the rightmost one, but gave all sorts of other reasons as to why they had, why they had chosen it. So faced with this, let's come back to algorithms. A key argument we could make is that, distinct from the question of whether algorithms are going to make discrimination better or worse, since either of those are possibilities, um, Let's instead argue that well-regulated algorithms can at least make discrimination easier to detect because algorithms are built in a certain way that actually makes them, in some dimensions, much more interpretable than humans. Now, when I talk about algorithms, it's of course important to pause and note the following thing, which while we all know it, uh, if we're in computer science, um, often we don't say it enough, that, that when we say the algorithm, we actually mean two algorithms, right? There's the training algorithm that takes training data and outputs a classifier, and then there's the classifier that takes instances and outputs a decision, right? The training algorithm is an algorithm whose output is algorithms, is a classifier. The classifier is what then takes the person and, and outputs the decision. And we could think about the interpretability uh, of both of these. Now, I should stress, trying to interpret what an algorithm is doing uh, is not about trying to read the code and expecting to understand the algorithm. There are several reasons why that's not likely to work. Uh, one is the cognitive difficulty of reading code. And the other is things like the theory of, of undecidability that says we literally can't read code and predict the eventual outcome of the algorithm. But we can do many things that are not available uh, when we have a, say, human hiring committee. We can, for example, examine the features that went into the construction of, of the algorithm. Say it was done with the standard machine learning pipeline. We can examine the objective function, right? Again, on slide two, if you had forced me to ask, what is the human hiring committee doing when they look at a resume? What is their objective function? It would have been very hard to say what is the human objective function, right? Human decision making does not work by first writing down a concrete objective function and then relentlessly adhering to it. But that is what an algorithm built using the machine learning pipeline uh, is typically doing. Similarly, we can take data, and if we suspect that there's bias or there's unjustified disparate impact, we can take that same training data and, as in something like the Netflix prize competition, we could build our own screening rule. We could see if we can achieve the same performance with less disparate impact. And finally, we can take the screening rule itself and we can probe it with synthetic instances. We can say, here is the feature vector of someone where you made a decision. I'm now going to flip the value of attribute number 28 and see if you make the same decision. We could ask this question to a human decision maker. We could say, would you have still hired this person um, had they been of a different ethnic background? Um, the person might try to give us an answer, um, but as 40 years of behavioral science experiments show us, it's very hard to know why we should believe that answer. Now, throughout all of this, I've been saying a well-regulated algorithm, and that's, that's absolutely crucial. All of these arguments depend on being able to examine the process by which the algorithm was constructed. For example, so that we can try to build our own, right, in the event, say, of a lawsuit for discrimination, try to build our own using training data so that we could probe the classifier using synthetic instances. Um, all of these would be necessary. If we don't have access to some of those things, then the then algorithm just becomes a powerful tool that's kept obscure. And if I have an actor with bad intent and I give that actor a powerful tool, then they have even more power in, in achieving their bad intent. So it's crucial that, th that there be some regulation in place. This regulation, of course, in includes enormous amount of record keeping. You could say, in principle, this is saying that every time you use an algorithm, you would have to record you know, the features you use, the objective function, and even worse, the whole training pipeline with the training data. And you may say that's very onerous, but one observation that comes out of work in public policy is that when society deems something sufficiently important, sometimes they impose those onerous restrictions. Um, financial markets, um, as 
Michael, who introduced me at the beginning, could uh, say more than most of us, are subject to enormous levels of record keeping requirements. Transactions must be logged. Huge amounts of data must be saved because of the concerns about, um, about potential bad behavior in the financial domain. So it's something which is in principle a lever that we have at our disposal, should we choose to use it. Let me talk about just briefly, you know, what might happen if we examine a machine learning pipeline. And in the process, um, also start to introduce a model that I want to use in the, the second half of the talk, as I think about the role of interpretability and probing of an algorithm in the construction of these algorithms. So here's a model that uh, I want to suggest, an extremely simple model to sort of think about the, the machine learning pipeline. So I have individuals and I'm making screening decisions about them. I have a feature vector X for each individual. Later, maybe we'll imagine it to be a Boolean feature vector made up of zeros and ones, but it's not crucial right now. I have a productivity function, f of x, as a function of the feature. So I get an individual, the true function I care about, you know, and, and we're gonna take a stylized model in which there is some actual thing along which I'm sorting applicants, say for a job, right? If only I had abs access to this idealized function, I would be able to rank people by, by productivity. Um, obviously it'll emerge that it's difficult to get access to this function, but that's the ide ide ideal, to sort by f of x and to take, take the top few. Now, I'm concerned about disparities. So I have an advantage group and I have a disadvantage group. And the way in which one group is disadvantaged relative to another is in the distribution of feature vectors. So the frequency of a feature vector x in group A is some mu of xA, and in group D is mu of xD. And so the point is, if I knew x, which may not contain the group membership, I wouldn't care about group membership. I know everything I need to know for this decision. The reason there's disadvantage is because of the different distributions of features. So we could term this structural dis disadvantage. I'll call it D of F, you know, uh, D for disparity. And it's the weighted sum of F of X in the advantage group minus the weighted sum of F of X in the disadvantage group, okay? And so that's really what's, 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 what's going on here. Not that any one individual is actually, um, uh, the, the group membership is sufficient, but that we have this difference as a weighted average. And of course, I could do this for any function v. For any function v applied to x, I could say the disparity in v is the same weighted sum. Okay, now let's think about the machine learning pipeline. Um, so in the machine learning pipeline, um, I'm just checking because everyone can still hear me. There was some background noise. Good, okay. Um, so in the machine learning pipeline, um, a few things happen. First, we don't have access to this function uh, g. We have access to a, uh, this function f. We have access to a function g. Um, second, we don't really have access to the full set of feature vectors. We have access to this reduced representation r of x, which is going to be some lower dimensional representation. Um, now, <clears throat> there's a syntactic problem, which is x is a very wide feature vector. r of x is narrow. So I, I can't apply g of x, my objective function, to the uh, narrow feature vector. I have to apply some narrower function, let's call it h. So I'm gonna use h composed with r. First apply r, then apply h. Finally, of course, I can't even get the h that I want because I have some finite sample of training data. I'm gonna train my algorithm on that finite sample. So I won't produce h, I'll produce some trained function t composed with r. And so the question we have to ask is, <clears throat> what is the disparity d of t composed with r? That is the disparity that emerges from this machine learning pipeline. And an interesting thing happens once you write down all of these definitions, which is that a, a particular answer emerges that actually matches much of the qualitative discussion that we see around uh, bias in machine learning. If I choose to write D of T composed with R in this sort of deliberately expansive telescoping form as D of F plus D of G minus D of F plus D of H composed with R minus D of G plus D of T composed with R minus D of A, H composed with R, right? Literally just a set of terms each of which cancels out parts of the previous one. Then I notice that this is a sum of four terms, each of which has some meaning in the discourse around bias and machine learning. The first is the structural disadvantage, the disadvantage that exists in the world that we may want to eliminate, but that existed upstream of any decisions I made about machine learning. Second is the bias from the choice of outcomes, G instead of F. The third is the bias from the choice of features, R and H composed with R instead of G. And finally, the bias in the training procedure. And so in principle, if we have access to the machine learning pipeline and we can examine it, then we have the ability to decompose the disparities across all of these. And as we know, evaluating claims of discrimination largely depends on attributing an observed disparity, which we all agree exists, to 
its underlying causes, right? To ask who should we hold liable for this disparity if we want to remedy it. So th this is a summary of, of the observation, observational aspect, right? The auditing aspect, that there's an ob opportunity for computational analysis to identify mechanisms leading to bias, this attributing of, of, of observed caps, the fact that algorithms contain explicit ingredients that we could never ever expect from humans, an explicit objective function, an explicit notion of training, the ability to probe uh, with new instances, even if we can never actually read the code of the algorithm. And finally, that all of this would actually require regulation. It also require the ability to examine algorithms. Otherwise, we simply have bad actors with even more powerful tools. So all of this is about a form of interpretability. But I want to argue that there's actually issues of interpretability and bias, even in the construction of algorithms. And that's what I want to move on to next. And in, in, the, in, in, in the process, I'll try to construct a model of how this might happen. And that model, while it will be, will be about algorithms, I think will contain some suggestive observations about how stereotypes and biases arise even in our own human decision-making. So let's go back to our model. Applicants are described by Boolean variables. There's a function f of x that's productivity. Um, and we're gonna sort by this f value. And we're gonna admit the top r fraction of the applicants. Right? This is a, a company that has a set of applicants. They'd like to accept the top r fraction or it's a, an educational program. We would like to admit the top R fraction. We have advantage disadvantage groups, A and D as before. And again, this crucial fact that the function F is independent of the group. I don't care what group you're in if I have access to all of the features. Nonetheless, there's disadvantage, and this was the final component, because the allocation of valuable features is unevenly distributed. Group A tends to have more features and a greater abundance of features leading to high values of the productivity. If X is a better feature vector than X prime from the point of view of F, then the relative abundance of it in group A is higher. Okay, and that'll be our disadvantage condition. Let me walk through an example of how this might work in, in, a, in a sort of stylized setting. So this is a very simple uh, prediction problem. Um, it's small enough that I can write it as a truth table on this slide and we can all do it in real time. So obviously it's, you know, questions about interpretability aren't going to literally apply here because we can all interpret what's going on, but we'll be able to talk about the ingredients of, of the model using it. So imagine I have two variables, they're both Boolean, x1, x2. Um, and the true criterion is a conjunction of x1 and x2. Okay, so the applicants from, now the applicants from group A are advantage. So they, so it's a conjunction. So f is one only if both values are one. And applicants from group A have x1, have each variable set equal to one with probability two thirds independent. And applicants from group D have x1 set equal to one with probability only one third, right? So here we have, if I know the two values, I know the value of f. Nonetheless, group D is disadvantaged because it, the, the features are distributed differently. Okay, so notice that at all admission rates up to 5 18 which is the set of uh, the, the subset of the population that has f equal to one, um, all the admitted people have f value one. So if I were admitting like that, I'd be getting sort of the best I could do in terms of f. Only a one fifth fraction would come from group D, right? Because one eighteenth of the population has f equal to one from group D and four eighteenths from group A. E equal size groups in the two populations. Now let's talk about simplification, okay? So the kind of interpretability I'll think about is this idea of reducing the feature vector, right? Perhaps I want to simplify it by only collecting some of the variables. In our simple example, maybe I simplify f by only collecting x1, not both features. Why do I do that? Well, perhaps collecting x2 is just too expensive. Maybe for example, this is PhD admissions and x1 is you know, how well, you know, how, how, how good are your grades? And x2 is some long form subjective analysis of how good your independent research is. And if I have limited resources for evaluating, it may be much easier to evaluate grades than a subjective evaluation of some paper that you wrote as an undergrad. Um, for larger instances, I may be reducing it simply for interpretability or cognitive complexity. Intriguingly, I may also be doing it for machine learning reasons, right? Regularization suggests that sometimes reducing the complexity of the functional forms I'm allowed have benefits for out of sample generalization. And so I might in fact be simplifying projecting out variables for that reason. Any of these ways, um, if we project out X2, let me continue my example, then I have this reduced truth table. What I've done is I've collapsed rows. I've said any, anyone, you know, any of the rows that has a one here will all get clumped together. And I'll simply look at the average value of F. 
over those rows. Because when I'm admitting people with x1 equal to 1, I can't tell anything else about them. So I'm getting one of the, just an average draw from that population. Half the population is there, and the average value is 5 minutes. And if x1 equals 0, well, it's a conjunction. So I know f is 0, and half the population is there. So I'll call this collapsed truth table an f approximator. I've collapsed rows. I've assigned each applicant their expected value in that collapsed cell. Um, and I admit them in this order. Now notice that all small values of admission rate, right, for sufficiently small r, the average f value is 5 ninths, not 1. And the average fraction that comes from the disadvantage group, group D, is 1 third, not 1 fifth. So it's a story that we see elsewhere. Relative to the true f, we have gains in, in inequity. 1 third comes from group D, not 1 fifth. Losses in efficiency, I'm getting 5 ninths, not 1. So simplification does confer these benefits. But I want to argue, even in this simple example, uh, and all the more so in more complex examples, it also can cause two potential difficulties. Here's the first potential difficulty. Um, it's that something can happen, which I'll call simplification transforming disadvantage into bias. Let's take my f approximator. And let's ask the question of the decision maker, would you like to know the group membership of the applicant you're looking at? Now, with the original eight row truth table, um, that was not true. If you would ask the decision maker, do you want to know the group membership? They'd say, no, I do not care what group this person comes from because I have all the information I need in X. With the simplified table, however, that's no longer the case. Now, suddenly, the decision maker is incentivized to learn the group membership of the applicant because it contains conditional information about the feature that they don't have access to, X2. Right? And they're going to use it in a pernicious way because due to structural disadvantage, applicants from group A have a higher average value of X2. And therefore, they're actually, in expectation, more likely to do well on f. Right? So the simplification of the function has created an incentive where no incentive previously existed for the decision maker to seek out the group membership. Now, what's interesting is that this is, in fact, posited as a mechanism for stereotype formation in everyday life. The argument is often that stereotypes uh, and negative biases are particularly dangerous in situations of reduced cognitive bandwidth low information. When I know less, when I have to make snap decisions, I'm more likely to fall back on, on stereotypes. And we often think of this as a human psychological phenomenon. Um, but what this example and what our model argues is that it's actually a much more general thing than this. Even an eight-line truth table will fall back on stereotypes and biases if you constrain it to use less information. And we see this in a number of policy domains where attempts to reduce information available to hiring committees has caused them, in fact, to fall back on pernicious stereotypes. Here's a second point, which is that simplification isn't even the optimal trade-off between efficiency and equity. It's Pareto dominated by other things you can do. Let's look at the second thing I could have done to the simplified F approximator. I could have said, let me invest the effort for members of group D to actually learn what their value of x2 is. Okay, And um, so when it's equal to 1, I have x1 equals x2 equals 1, group D. I'll admit those people first, because I know their value is equal to 1. That's 1 18th of the population. Then I'll fall back on the people for whom I didn't collect that. And that's going to be um, now average of 1 half. And finally, um, it's, I'm going to fall back on just it's equal to 0. Okay. Think of this, go back to my example, where maybe x1 was a cheap thing, like grades in, 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 in an admissions process. And x2 was an expensive thing, like looking in depth at somebody's research. I might, in moving from the truth table on the right to the truth table on the left, I might say, let me create an internship program for members of this disadvantaged group. We, we aren't admitting enough people from, from this group. Let me create an internship program for members of this group where I can actually watch them do research and collect with greater expense the value of x2. I now have the ability to admit people who score f equals 1. And, and, what, and what have I done? I've simultaneously improved the proportion of group D and I've improved the average value of f relative to my simplified truth table. Right? I've simultaneously improved both. It's a Pareto improvement. Right? There's an emission rate at which I'm strictly improving on efficiency, the average value of f. And I'm, and I'm simultaneously improving on strictly on equity, the fraction that comes from group D. Okay? So that's sort of a summary of what happens in our example. We start here with this large truth table, large in our example. Uh, we simplify it. And when we simplify it, we get to an unstable point on the landscape of truth tables. In one direction, we fall into incentivized bias, where the truth table morphs into something that has a pernicious stereotype. And we also, in a different direction, fall into Pareto improvement, where we can simultaneously improve efficiency and equity. And the 
the main result that we have in this work um, is that this doesn't just happen in simple examples. It actually happens for all Boolean functions. So the theorem that Sendel and I were able to prove is that for every Boolean function f with real valued outputs that satisfy the, this, our disadvantage condition, this likelihood ratio condition, and a generosity assumption, which I won't be able to get into. And for every simplification of it, collapsing rows of a truth table into cells, then one, there's always a Pareto improvement, always an, an F approximator that strictly improves on our, our simplification G in both efficiency equity. And two, if our simplification G does not use group membership, then adding group membership as a variable increases efficiency and reduces equity, and therefore becomes a pernicious stereotype, right? It's, a, it's, it's an attractive stereotype because it increases efficiency, and it's pernicious because it reduces equity. Now, I want to spend um, two minutes just talking about sort of one subtlety in the, in the proof of this. Um, because if we move from simple examples like the one I showed to the general case, there's one extra complicated thing that pops up uh, that, that you have to overcome in the analysis. And for that, let me show you an example that's more complicated. We're not gonna work it out in real time, but it started from the question, this likelihood ratio condition that said that for every feature vector X, and x prime, where x is better than x prime, a is more overrepresented. Could we have replaced that with a weaker notion of disadvantage? Like simply the mean f value in group A exceeds the mean f value in group D, right? That'd be a weaker form of disadvantage. Um, in that case, our theorem wouldn't actually hold it as is. That's too weak a form of disadvantage for our, our theorem to hold. And this example shows one where group A has a higher mean value of f than group D. But if I simplify my function by projecting out x2 and replacing with averages, then for every choice of x1, group D has a higher average value of f. Okay, so group D is disadvantaged when you look over the whole population. But if all I know is x1, then actually for every value of x1, group D has a higher average. So something weird happens. In this simplification, a strange stereotype emerges in which the decision maker wants the value of the group membership, and it's so that they can favor the disadvantaged group. Even though if they were drawing someone from the population as a whole, knowing absolutely nothing, they would favor the advantage group, right? At first, this seems kind of paradoxical. How can it be that learning a bit actually flips which group has the advantage? And in fact, it's called a paradox in statistics. This in fact is Simpson's paradox. That's possible to have the marginal distribution in, 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 go one way for every set of the variables, even though the overall distribution goes the other way. And so the hard part in proving our theorem is to actually use our disadvantage condition to prove what you might call an anti-Simpson result. That with the stronger disadvantage condition, Simpson's paradox literally can't, 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 can't arise. So in some sense, the key combinatorial lemma in all of this is sort of said very briefly the following. Assume not just that the mean is different between the groups, but that we have the stronger likelihood ratio condition. For better, if X is a better feature vector than X prime, then it's more overrepresenting group A in X than X prime. And then the theorem you have to prove is that for any non-trivial partition of the feature vectors for A into cells, that, where we take the averages, and separately the feature vectors for D into cells, where we take the averages, and we assign each cell their average value, then there exists a feature vector for which the advantage group has a higher estimated value than the disadvantage group. That this is the breaking of Simpson's paradox, that there's always at least one feature vector where the advantage group actually has the advantage. And once you have that one foothold, you can actually then run, run the rest of the proof. And it, it looks much, much like the examples I was showing you, but this is somehow the core of it. So, so I wanted to wrap up here. Um, at this level of construction, uh, even very basic forms of simplification of functions can actually, in the construction of algorithms, lead to surprising outcomes, including pernicious incentives and Pareto improvements in our goals in the first place. But more broadly, I think there are these fascinating connections uh, between bias on the one hand and interpretability on the, on the other hand. The way in which interpreting algorithms <clears throat> in ways that we could never do with humans can actually expose uh, and allow us to decompose the bias. And secondly, the way in which it shows up in construction. And I'll go back to the point in which I began the talk. And again, sort of how I conceive of a, a conference like this, that many fields are going to be needed to play a role in setting the priorities that we make in our construction and our auditing of, of algorithms. And I think it's one where all these areas are going to be part of a rich conversation that I'm very much looking forward to going forward. Thanks very much. Great, thanks John for a terrific and as always enlightening talk. Um, so we have a few minutes for Q and A.
Uh, if you're an audience member, I believe you should post your question to the Q&A um, window. And if you are a panelist, you should post to the uh, chat window. And I, I think I'm seeing them. I can ask a question. Sure. Go Cynthia. for it, Cynthia. Okay. So this is this is lovely. And you've given a very stylized form of interpretability. Um, could you comment on whether you see, and, and, and the nice thing about this is, I understand exactly what you mean by it. Yeah. But can you, can you comment as to whether you see uh, other stylized forms, like is it now going to be the rage to start finding stylized forms of, of interpretability that we can actually quantify? Or do you think that there's there's something inheriting inheritingly limited and for quantified versions? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, right, in a way, thanks for giving me the chance to kind of talk about what is the broader role interpretability is playing in this talk. I, I should say that's personally I find interpretability a fascinating question. I enjoy following the work on it. And I, I feel like there's sort of a huge amount of conceptual work left to be done there. Um, in a way that use of interpretability in this talk had a kind of excluded middle. For, for purposes of auditing, it was meant in a very general sense. It was the ability to examine the algorithm in whatever form that, that, that might take, sort of left to be determined by the policy process. And that, in a sense, was almost sort of too expansive. And then in the second part, for the purpose of building a model, it was, in a sense, too, res too restrictive. It means interpretability by collapsing uh, rows of a, of a, of a function into, into, into cells. I think there's this, this intermediate level where there are these sort of rich algorithmic notions of what does it mean to, to either produce an interval model or produce an interpretation of a black box model. Um, and I think one thing that's key for all of, for future formalizations of it, you know, which I think of as a, as a fascinating open question, is to say that interpretability is gonna somehow have to depend on the reason for interpretability, right? I, I feel like a, no, a notion of who is the consumer of the interpretation is going to be crucial for how we choose to formalize interpretability. And so there will likely be many different formalizations for different contexts in which people are consuming the interpretation for different reasons. And in some sense, you could view the second half of the talk as a particular reason under which you're consuming the interpretation. But it's a, it's a fascinating question. And one which I think, you know, theoretical computer science work is really ideally set up. It, it's a, a thorny definitional challenge that is, I think, really fascinating to think about. Thanks. Um, John, maybe we'll take one question from the audience um, before we run out of time. It's from uh, Eric Meeling. So the question is similar to how we cannot trust the explanation that a human gives for making a particular decision, for example, the tide example. How should one verify the correctness of the explanation that an algorithm may provide for making a decision? Right. So this is, uh, I think that there, there are a lot of interesting dimensions for, 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 for asking this. Um, it, you know, I think, you know, a, f a few things to say. One, you know, obviously, if the algorithm is hidden from us, um, then it's a, it's a problem for trust and explanations. If, if, we're, if we're given some kind of indirect access and we're told to trust the output that we're being told, obviously that's the same as not having access to it. Um, read, having access, if we try to read the code, that's gonna be difficult for all the reasons I mentioned. There is a role for formal verification. So I'll say that, you know, a fascinating question for formal verification is can algorithms come with sort of their own accompanying proofs, uh, their own accompanying sort of verification output that might might give us some ability to, to work with them. And then finally, I, th I think there are the interactive methods, right? There's the interactive probing of algorithms. Um, and I think, you know, there we can think about on the one hand, things like interactive proofs as, as a potential direction. And on, in a different direction, you know, work on replicability of scientific experiments. We could think of the construction of a machine learning algorithm as something like the running of an elaborately complicated scientific experiment. And we, we can now do several things to decide if we trust the conclusion of that experiment. We could examine the pipeline by which it was constructed. We could redo it. We could run our own experiment. And I think all of those are levers that we also have at our disposal when we think about, about trying to trust the output of an algorithm. Okay, great. Well, we're at 2.20, so let's give John a virtual round of applause for a terrific talk. Thanks very um, much. Thanks, John. Um,
And uh, I think Yi, are you the uh, session chair now? Are you gonna? Is somebody gonna give him yeah, control? Yeah, okay. uh, Guy is the the next session chair, and I think he can rest control himself. Okay. <laughs>